Welcome everyone, Kalispera sas in Alada, to what will be an exciting discussion of the current upheavals roiling the global semiconductor industry. I am Max Nikias, Professor of Electrical Engineering and President Emeritus of the University of Southern California, Calimera, Apodo, Los Angeles. Let me take a few minutes to set the stage for our discussion before I introduce our panel. Who would have thought even 10 years ago that semiconductor chips would become the world's most important industry? These chips are the foundation for artificial intelligence applications, 5G networks, robotics, automotive, telehealth, remote work and education, virtual and augmented reality, and streaming entertainment. Even more advanced chips will be needed in the space race, going to Mars and colonizing the moon. It is well known that semiconductor chips have critical military applications. The most advanced chips have circuits that are three to five nanometers thick. Imagine three nanometers, that is the thickness of six silicon atoms. The brains of the iPhone 12 is a five nanometer chip. It contains almost 12 billion transistors. And IBM just announced last week that it has created the world's first two nanometer chip. The United States, the European Union, particularly the Netherlands, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan are the key players in the complex supply chain required to create these chips. Notably absent from this group is China. Despite a mighty effort, China has been unable to design or produce the most advanced chips and currently spends about $300 billion a year importing semiconductor chips. It's their largest single import. Because of concerns over China's military acquiring this technology, the United States and its allies have implemented controls limiting China's access. But let's make no mistake about it. China is working very hard to catch up. A senior security expert in Washington, D.C. recently stated that whoever controls the design and production of these microchips will set the course for the 21st century. Last month, outgoing U.S. military commander in the Pacific warned that China may very well invade Taiwan to gain control of its semiconductor industry and especially one company, TSMC. So to summarize, semiconductors have become the ground zero of the global technology competition. So joining us today from Silicon Valley is Dr. Chifu Chen, President and Co-Chief Executive Officer of Synopsys, an SAP 500 company and the largest electronic design automation company for silicon design, verification, intellectual property, and software security. Bottom line, to design the semiconductor chips, even the most advanced, one has to use Synopsys software. Dr. Chan has been responsible for starting many global sites of Synopsys, including Taiwan and China. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Lindsey Gorman, Fellow for Emerging Technologies at the German Marshall Funds Alliance for Securing Democracy. Her research focuses on understanding and crafting a transatlantic response to China's techno-authoritarian rise from 5G and the future of the internet to information manipulation and censorship. She regularly writes and briefs senior government leaders across the Atlantic on these topics. And also joining us from Washington, D.C. is Ramko Zwetslut, Research Fellow at Georgetown University's Center for Security and Emerging Technology, 
focused on US AI and computing workforce, immigration policy, research security, and US-China technology transfer issues. His writings have appeared in academic journals and popular media outlets. So Chifun, Lindsay, and Ramko, thank you so much for joining us today. And let me start with you, Lindsay. China's failure to develop the ability to make the most advanced semiconductor chips despite massive investments and the controls by the Trump administration, which were continued by the Biden administration, has produced a tension with the West. Could you talk about that tension between China and the West that this is producing? Thanks so much for having me, Max, and to the, to the Delphi Economic Forum for inviting me on this panel. I look forward to a, an interesting discussion from uh, and for, and with with such great experts here today. Um, I'd like to to take a, a little bit of a step back when thinking about this question of tension be, between China and the West, and and really cast it in the frame. Uh, that I think is most appropriate, which is and the way that we think about it at the Alliance for Securing Democracy, which is really in the context of this, uh, this broader competition between aut autocracies and democracies that's increasingly taking place over the information space and the technology space. Um, so I would I would say that the the current race for semiconductor self-sufficiency and semiconductor predominance um, is not the only contributor to this tension, but actually these tensions go go deeper to really a difference of systems of governance that are that are being played out in an unlikely battleground, which is over technology, which has traditionally, right. at least in, in the United States and many Western democracies, been driven by the private sector. Um, but I think as we've we've seen over the last few years, that there that these new technologies at, at which chips are really really, really at the center um, of, of artificial intelligence, of 5G infrastructure, of, of the future of the internet, um, of next generation technologies in, in that all have to do with the storage and the processing and the harnessing of information for economic and for military value. These technologies are taking an unlikely center stage in this competition, this broader systemic competition um, between the rise of authoritarian power, namely China, which has doubled down on its technological leadership and aims to lead the world in a number of these industries that are going to be dependent on semiconductors. And because I think one of the reasons the semiconductor question is so interesting here is that unlike some industries that are perhaps more siloed in globally. This industry is highly connected. It is is highly globally integrated from at all stages of the semiconductor process. You know, from the initial designs to the fabrication to inputting them into devices. And so, last year, um, when when the Trump administration was actually trying to convince um, allies and partners, primarily in Europe, but also also on, around the world, to actually exclude um, the, the telecommunications giant Huawei from 5G infrastructure as nations are building out their next generation of telecommunications infrastructure, this question came up over whether a, a Chinese vendor that has unclear ties to the Chinese Communist Party and is ultimately accountable um, to that government and authoritarian one party regime should really be the one building the critical infrastructure um, in many democracies. And for, you know, on the United States side, I think the, the answer was a clear no. And part of this campaign to convince allies and partners that, that would, this would actually create an unreasonable de dependency would open these countries up to espionage, both traditional and corporate as well, um, and would really disadvantage them in the long run. Um, one of the, the tools that the Trump administration used um, was something called the Foreign Direct Product Rule, where it said that you know, the United, United States companies are not going to be able to sell to to companies like Huawei um, and or companies that are on 
um, this entity list. And so that really, that's where I think semiconductors really entered into this picture because semiconductors were one of the technologies that were getting sold to China by companies, not just in the United States, but by many, in, in many of these core, um, area, core countries that you mentioned in your opening remarks. And I think that right. set into cascade, um, a chain of events that really has put semiconductors at the center um, of these tension between autocracies and democracies. And I think, you know, for for democracies, why it's so important that the that we are able to build technologies and succeed in technologies is that these technologies are not only neutral items, um, but actually are being used in ways that not only advantage uh, militaries, both both allied and, and authoritarian, um, but also the the systemic degradation of, of basic universal rights um, through a techno authoritarian model that China uh, is, 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 is putting up as an offering globally um, and saying that we have this, this model where we're going to process massive quantities of data using these semiconductors and give you sort of a better, a better life, um, a, safer, a safer city, uh, a, a better decision making power. And, but by the way, we're going to c control all this information and and stifle what you can say, uh, and and censor and surveil. And so it's really this competing set of models that I think we're talking about today when we're talking about the geopolitical dynamics of semiconductors. It's really about the ability of countries to say, you know, which which model uh, is the one you want, and and which one is going to succeed in the twenty first century. Yep. That's a good point, Lindsay. Uh, thank you, and we'll come back to that. And uh, so let me let me come to you, uh, Remco. That uh, worldwide worldwide demand for semiconductor chips, as Lindsay already pointed out, is growing rapidly. So, what are some of the new technologies that are driving this demand? And uh, uh, from your perspective, how important is artificial intelligence? Yeah, and uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for, for having me. Um, I think artificial intelligence is a big part of these developments. Um, it is not the only part. You know, when you think of what AI systems do and what they rely on, it is computation. It is taking in data and then, you know, processing that, doing something with it, um, uh, you know, making a decision, categorizing an image, doing those types of things. And chips are central to that. I mean, computation is what chips are, are needed for. So that is, I think, a big, a big driver when we look at the increase in demand for, for chips that we are seeing is the rise of, of AI and AI systems. Um, the, uh, you know, there's a wide range of inputs that these systems take in. If you think about, um, you know, self-driving cars, for example, they rely on, on lots of data. They have lots of sensors. It's image data. It's other kinds of data. They have to process that, store it. Um, uh, you know, transmit it, uh, and then make a decision. Do we break? Do we turn left? Do we turn right? Uh, if you think about, you know, voice assistants that you have in the home, they take in your voice data, and then they have to search a database for the favorite song that you want to put on. Um, these are all sort of inputs, you know, that you're, you're getting the, the range of inputs is getting more complicated. Um, the processing and transmitting is, is getting more complicated. And then the decisions uh, that AI systems can make are also getting more complicated. So that's you know, lots of computational demands. And then lots of that is happening through, uh, through cloud computing as well. So you, know, you have to transmit that data to a central database that tech companies uh, are increasingly building. And so a lot of the demand is coming from building you know, bigger data centers to handle more and more of this information flow as well. AI is not the only part of this though. Uh, there's lots of uh, chips in, you know, household devices that don't do very complex computation. They don't deal with, you know, traffic situations like a self-driving car would. There's semiconductors in your toothbrush, in your washing machine, in your toaster. Uh, you see the chip shortage that we're seeing today hit a lot of these household items that people might not have realized actually contain a lot of computer chips and do at least some kind of computation. Uh, there's also traditional cars that don't have, you know, a lot of self-driving functionality that contain a lot of semiconductors. And those are also being hit by the current chip shortages. So it spans a real range from sort of cutting edge AI systems that do incredibly complex tasks to very basic things that still do 
some computation. And Lindsay, you know, talked about the telecommunication sector yeah. being huge here. Uh, you could go on and on about, you know, the sectors that use semiconductors, but AI is a big, big part of it. It's not the only part. Right, right. Thank you, Ramco. And uh, uh, Chifun, coming to you, you are in Silicon Valley, uh, you, uh, I know you work uh, extensively with many operations around the world of Synopsis, including Taiwan and China. So like many big uh, technology companies, Synopsis has a significant presence in China. And China and its people benefit immensely from advanced semiconductor chips. So my question to you is, how do you do business in China, given the restrictions that we have in place, that they were imposed by the Trump administration and extended by the Biden administration? This must be very difficult balancing act, not only for Synopsis, but of course, for all the other technology companies. So how do you do business in China? Well, I'm very happy to be here. So uh, first, thank you, uh, Max, for inviting me. And thank you for the Delphi Corporation. And much honored to be on the same panel as uh, Lindsay and Remco to discuss this very important <laughs> topic. So first, thank you. Um, yeah, you raise a very good question. Clearly, uh, China, US is in the news. And Semiconductor is very much in the news. Um, so the good news is Semiconductor value is highly recognized right now. Right. I would say right. the way I would approach the issue would be say in this 40, 50, depending how you count our semiconductor industry, it has grown up into a $500 billion industry with a very, with a model of a very tightly coupled global system. And due to good policies and understanding of why we needed to have more uh, geographic, geopolitical separation, is now changing in, from a tightly coupled system to probably a loosely coupled system. And in engineering, we all know what that means. Um, there'll be realignment, there'll be readjustment and everything else. And that's what you meant uh, when you say, what are the challenges and balancing in, um, in a high tech company doing business in China? So first, let's talk about ecosystem. Um, I think Lindsay already alluded to it. Um, uh, in the beginning, really, there is the design part of the semiconductor. There is the manufacturing part. Then there is the equipment part. Then there's also tests and packaging. And then they, then these are applications. And they're all actually, even though they look like stages, they're very related. You know, what you want in a cell phone affects how you would design it. What, how you would design it affects on the process, affects on the manufacturing, on the cost, affects on the test. So when these tightly coupled system, which are, uh, and I'll get into the specific vulnerability of the uh, semiconductor chain when um, in this, in this uh, fashion, when it's changed, all kind of other effects come in. And it's not so much balancing uh, from a business point of view it has to be adapting, just constantly adapting to the different changes that is global and to the requirement in different things. SIA recently publishes a report um, that said the vulnerability in the supply chain that's unique to semiconductor, or at least specific to semiconductor is one, is very geographically um, concentrated, whether it's in one area or the other, and we can go into that for other reasons, why historically it's grown up to be geographically very much um, uh, concentrated in one area and the other. And either because of that or, or unrelated, the talent pool that goes to feed these industry are also geographically uh, uh, spread out. And then right. you now couple with many government that are now have diff uh, pursuing different policies of where they would invest and they would um, do business. It makes this entire ecosystem a lot more complicated. But you know, Max, the good news is the semiconductor business, we say change is the only constant. So whether it's a challenges in physics, challenges in chemistry, or challenges in business model, or just interaction, uh, we will adapt and thrive as a whole industry. Right. And, as, and it certainly as a US semiconductor company, 
we are clearly will follow all the rules and follow all the laws that are required. Whether we, you know, whether we agree or disagree with some of the policies, or we will follow it because it is important that we go from this stage to a different stage of this loosely coupled right. system, where you'll be redefined. The ecosystem will be redefined. Yeah, yeah. So thank change. you, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, change is the only constant comes from the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. <laughs> oh, <Okay>. uh, <laughs> so Remco, uh, coming back uh, to you, uh, uh, on the one hand, there is a push for a more United States European Union collaboration on technology from the current Biden administration, but on the other hand. The European Union is also emphasizing strategic independence. And leaders in Europe might be hesitant to rely too much on the United States. How will this play out in the semiconductor sector over the next few years? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, you know, there's lots changing even on a week by week basis now. Of course, the Biden administration is newly in office and so they're still figuring it out. I think you're hearing different sounds from different parts of Europe, right. uh, even within the European Union in general. We are increasingly seeing you know, an emphasis, as you said, on the strategic independence piece uh, for Europe as well. And we saw in the COVID relief package in March that the EU put out, that there was about $150 billion for the uh, digital industries in Europe in general. And lots of that was reserved for semiconductors specifically. So, you know, there's a there's real emphasis there. Um, there's tension, as you mentioned, between, you know, the goals of, of partnering here and the EU wanting to remain to some extent independent of the United States as well as China um and not becoming too reliant on the us as a partner in the long term when you know we know that us politics can shift pretty quickly from from the last few years right. and lindsay has great work i think on the sort of macro landscape there and the and the broader geopolitical issues uh in, right. in eu us relations on that front from a semiconductor perspective specifically I think leaders are going to discover that it's 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 very hard for Europe to become independent in any meaningful sense of the term. Uh, I think Chifun, you know, laid out kind of the different parts of the semiconductor supply chain and the semiconductor industry, and there's no single country that could contain all of those you know parts of the supply chain sort of at the cutting edge without you know wasting incredible amounts of money uh, trying to build up you know efficiency there when other countries are already at the cutting edge and have the talent, have the technology and that sort of thing. So, you know, I think there's there's parts of Europe, uh, including ASML in the Netherlands when it comes to lithography uh, and certain German firms when it comes to wafer technology, where Europe is actually at the cutting edge already. Uh, and I think it would be good for, you know, Europe to emphasize those strengths and to build on those and to extend those. Um, manufacturing you know, it's not taking place in the US very much and so, or in the European Union, excuse me. Um, and so I think there, you know, if, if Europe wants to become independent from a, a manufacturing perspective, uh, that I think a lot of experts would say is, is basically a lost cause because the foundation is just not right. there yet. Um, so, you know, depending on which part of the supply chain segment you're talking about, this picture can look pretty different. Uh, but real independence, you know, for the full supply chain is, is basically an unrealistic goal. And I hope leaders recognize yeah. that before, you know, wasting billions of dollars trying to achieve it. Right. It's an ecosystem that is so interconnected, as uh, Chifun pointed out. And uh, uh, people don't realize that uh, for the design and manufacturing of chips, uh, of chips if you look at the whole supply chain, I think uh, uh, there is a crossing of, uh, of borders, national borders, set more than 70 times, okay, just to get a, a, a chip out uh, into applications. But Lindsay, I, I know Remco already uh, pointed to you, and I want to come back to you on this one because you are really the expert. Is there any kind of strategy emerging in Western democracies to continue dominating the semiconductor industry? Uh, we would love to hear your thoughts on that and some more recent developments. Absolutely. So I think it's interesting. Again, I think, I think sort of the phrasing 
is interesting. Uh, you know, there are certainly, I think, you know, as Remco alluded to, there's there's certainly interest, I think, from the Biden administration in building networks of allies uh, in, in democracies, not just in the West, but globally around emerging technology issues and around semiconductors in particular. And I think one of the one of the sort of interesting pieces of this is that one of the initial forays into this type of cooperation um, actually, you know, was not solely in the West, but is taking place in in the Quad grouping, the the minilateral grouping of the United States, Australia, Japan, um, and India, and and they it looks like semiconductors, you know, potentially are going to be on that agenda. There's a quad emerging technology working group. Um, there's speculation that that's been discussed um, in conversation, bilateral conversations um, between the Biden administration and Japan. So this is actually going, uh, you know, beyond the West um, to figure out, you know, how to come up with secure supply chains that can extend across democracies. I actually think in the transatlantic context, um, it may actually even be a little bit more complicated because of the dyna- some of the dynamics that you and Remco um, were alluding to around this push that we're seeing in some parts of the EU for what they call digital sovereignty um, and a desire to sort of chart their own way uh, announcements of, of pouring funds into indigenous semiconductor manufacturing and development um, which, which as Remco mentioned, I think has 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 landed with skepticism on the ability for it to succeed for for many analysts um, in this space. But there is sort of this competition that's also inherent um, in in this industry that I think is going to complicate some of these efforts that that are you know high minded and certainly noble to bring democracies together in the West, but also outside it um, to really shore up these supply chains because I think. What we've seen is that there's a, an increasing reluctance to build dependencies on countries that perhaps are not aligned um, with the West and, and, and with democracies. And so I, I do think we are going to see semiconductors be part of that effort and a strong part of that effort. We're already perhaps seeing some of that um, in unfolding with the quad. Um, in the transatlantic context, it's, I think it's going to depend on sort of how much how much Europe really wants to go in this digital sovereignty direction and how much that can square with efforts and overtures from the Biden administration to jointly come together um, on a lot of these issues. You know, export controls, I think, are probably chief among them um, for areas for potential cooperation. Um, but, you know, there's always going to be these 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 private sector dynamics, these business dynamics that you know where right. where geopolitics you know isn't the driving factor, as, as probably Chief Moon can can uh, attest to. You know they're they're following the the winds, um, but you're always going to have national pride even among uh, countries and governments right. for individual companies. So I think that, so. To, I guess to sum it up, there is significant interest and perhaps a little movement already in the semiconductor industry for this kind of allied cooperation. But I don't think it's going to be um, as simple as saying we're cooperating um, and then you know that's it and right. our our supply chains are secure. Um, not not to say it's not a worthy goal. Um, but it's probably not a, you know, three month, three month proposition. Yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, uh, Chief Una, I, I want to come back uh, to uh, uh, to the issue of uh, uh, chip uh, sh- uh, uh, shortage. And uh, uh, there was even an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, yesterday that uh, car dealers in the United States are so upset. They're so angry. Uh, there is more than 1.2 million shortage of cars. And uh, so automakers have interrupted uh, production of certain models due to sporadic semiconductor chip shortages. While the chips in the cars are not the most advanced, they contain automotive-specific algorithms. And I, and I know Remco already talked about that. Why are these chips all of a sudden in a short supply. What really happened and how did we get here? That's a good question. Yeah, I heard that um, the shortage is going to continue for at least the second half of the year and may reach several more million cars. And at 4 million cars, it will be 
a significant dollars involved, right? That's several hundred in right. the terms right. of billions. So I think that uh, first, I think actually there are probably three reasons for it. Um, first, automotive chip relative to other chip, there are specific algorithm, but some of them are a general purpose or deliberate one. But what are the difference in the design or what are the difference between these chips and automotive chip and say cell phone? Um, besides the auto specific algorithm. Well, one is you have to design a lot um, with safety in mind and a lot more documentation because it go into many, many more system. And probably a very distinguishing future, uh, feature is what, probably not a great term, but engineering would call failure in time because a chip in the automotive need to last 15, 20 years, but most of us are probably not carrying a cell phone that's 15 or 20 year old. So there are some very specific requirement and then they go through a very specific qualification. So that's what make it a little bit more unique um, in the first place. And maybe the most important, the first important reason why they are in shorter supply uh, is they are just more electronics these days in automotive than ever before, than last year, than five years ago, than 10 years ago. The percentage of dependency on semiconductor is just a lot more. So the, then it come to the second point, because the dependency on these chips are so much more, the relationship between the OEM and the tier one, you know, the, the, all the other um, uh, tier one supplier and the semiconductor, that whole ecosystem is also in the process of changing, right? There are very few automotive company that directly sources from the semiconductor company. I would think, I was told that in the uh, uh, time of shortage, like the catalytic converter, when suddenly there was shortage of a material become very important to the entire system, the OEM has to change the supply chain to look at some of the sources of that material. So I go back to the ecosystem and the supply chain. When that supply chain changes and when the semiconductor company uh, can supply automotive chip or supply chips to network or to AI or to other area, and when there is a change and you wanted to change it back, uh, the supply demand curve takes time. There's a latency in it. So I see that again as another supply chain changes, which then get me to my third reason. We are in a very strange time right now, as you know. Uh, I believe the COVID-19 has an effect in this. Just like, look at us, we're using Zoom, we're losing a lot more electronics. The, with the COVID-19, with the whole year global pandemic, the amount of supply of chips for the infrastructure, for network, for PC, for server, for communication, for 5G or 4G or 3G has increased tremendously. With limited right. capacity and with the cap a lot of those were diverted when you don't need as many cars and you divert it, it cannot turn back on the dime, right? So I will conclude by, I think this difficulty is gonna just get more difficult because of another thing, the, the automotive now has a lot more chips. And guess what? It also has a lot more software, right? And you right, know this week, right. two days ago, President Biden just issued an executive order on the software supply chain on security. Right. And right. very few people have started to look at the software bomb, the bill of material, the SBOM. Right. When you look at the hardware bomb and you see the semiconductor as an issue, by the time you look at the software bomb, the complexity, yeah. well, you can see what the right. supply chain look like. And there's a mistaken concept that software is free in the sub, for us, uh, supply right. and demand is, is in, uh, very much more elastic. But you and I know everything has a cost and attention pair. Right. Right. So, right. Right. So, thank, thank you, you. Chifun. Yeah, I, it's, uh, we don't realize that uh, 10 years ago, the cars needed probably 10 or 20 chips. But today, the cars, uh, they, they need uh, more than 300 chips, each one of them. So this, uh, this, uh, the demand has increased enormously. In the remaining time, I know we have about eight minutes left. Uh, I want to come back to Lindsay uh, first, uh, that uh, Western democracies have traditionally had an open, transparent ecosystem in the technology sector. And you, you talked about that already. 
the culture has spurred rapid technological advances because we are the open society. But concern is growing over advanced technologies migrating to China's military and uh, with the theft of intellectual property. How do we maintain the open culture that fosters technology advances, but at the same time try to control the flow of technologies while protecting intellectual property? Max, that is the question of the day. Perhaps the perhaps the century, um, and I think that's something we're sort of all trying to figure out. Um, I don't I don't I don't proclaim to have all the answers, but can can give some broad guidelines. I think it's really you know on the on the first uh, on the first hand, it's really recognizing kind of what's at stake in this competition. Um, there's there's certainly some who would argue that you know anything coming from an authoritarian state. Um, or anyone coming from an authoritarian state poses a risk. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, there, there are some who would say that, you know, our open innovation and open um, information systems, because these are also about information platforms and information control, um, should be allowed to, to, should be open to everyone. Um, I think that probably neither of those approaches is, is going to be the right one to balance that tension um, that you alluded to between the the true positives of our open, not just our open innovation system, but really the openness of our democracy, the, the ability that anyone can come here and work hard and succeed. That's, that's so core, not only to our own economic success, but also to our attractive power globally. And, and I know Remco has done a lot of work on the talent side of this. And that's yep. really a piece of it that I think often really gets lost because it, particularly on on talent we're in a, a global competition um you know with with china with others and there are there are some politicians who have actually argued in the united states that we should be excluding chinese researchers in these core high-tech fields of of semiconductors of artificial intelligence um of biotechnology because of the threat of espionage and I don't want to downplay the threat of, 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 of intellectual property theft. It is a massive drain on the U.S. economy. There are estimates, you know, up to $100 billion or so a year in economic loss than the United States loses from intellectual property theft. And I think, you know, we've seen over the course of, you know, the, the rise of Huawei, um, there has been there have been accusations uh, by the U.S. Justice Department of significant intellectual property theft that helped fuel that rise. So that I mean, these are really questions of long term competitiveness. So I, I don't want to downplay that threat. But I think if we can't proportionally measure the risks and the benefits, then we're going to have a problem with our own open innovation system. Um, so we really need a better a better risk assessment here. And, you know, I, I would definitely love to hear Remco's thoughts on, on the talent piece. But, you know, we gain so much more from inviting global talent and getting the best and the brightest in the world to stay here, to learn here, to set up their companies here, to become U.S. enterprises, to become taxpayers um, than, than we do then we lose um, in the risk that some of those innovations could also potentially, and you know, most of which are completely open and in the research community, not proprietary, um, could right. potentially advantage um, an authoritarian government. And, and I think in some of these areas, that's just the risk that we have to take. In others, and particularly uh, where I kind of draw the line, when it, when it comes to critical infrastructure, um, which I think the notions of which are sort of changing. You know, it's hard to say when become when something becomes critical infrastructure. You know, we know energy and telecommunications infrastructure, that's critical infrastructure. But, you know, is Google critical infrastructure? What what aspects of the internet are critical infrastructure? Um, but I think wherever we come down on that, allowing um, reliance or even signif a significant role of authoritarian uh, systems, authoritarian built systems in right. critical infrastructure, that's kind of where it starts hurting. That's where, where our openness gets weaponized um, against us. And so that's, I think, where we need to have our guard up a little bit more. But in these areas like talent um, that are clearly helping the United States and, and its democratic partners, uh, that's where I think we can go sort of too far in the, in the opposite direction. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, 
Uh, Remco, coming back to you, uh, I will give you two, three minutes. We are running out of time, but China is trying uh, hard to cultivate and acquire the high-tech talent needed to produce the advanced semiconductor chips. However, a very interesting development took place a few weeks ago when Taiwan, for the very first time, banned any Chinese job listings for technology in the country. Can you please elaborate uh, uh, these efforts? Can you elaborate a little bit for us? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a huge area, um, and we only have a little bit of time, so I'll keep it brief. I think there was a, a Tsinghua professor uh, in microelectronics who the other day said, uh, you know, the um, competition between um, uh, China and the United States in technology is essentially the competition for talent. So China is investing a ton in trying to recruit talent from abroad, and Taiwan is really on the front lines there because you know they're smaller, sort of cultural and linguistic barriers. And by some reports, they've recruited up to 10% of Taiwan's semiconductor workforce. I don't know if I believe those numbers exactly, but it's clearly a you know a large um, uh, a large problem there. And so Taiwan, I think, is taking kind of unprecedented measures. Uh, because of the scale of this problem. I think Lindsay said, well, the U.S. still benefits, really. China's trying to recruit in the U.S. as well, but they've been less successful than they have been in Taiwan. Um, and Taiwan has obviously a, a fantastic semiconductor sector. And so some of that talent is really at the high end. And that's what Chinese companies will need to succeed. Um, we'll see if that ban is, is going to be effective. But I think, you know, from a big picture perspective, whether China succeeds in recruiting a lot of this talent and building up its domestic workforce is going to be one of the key questions in determining whether China right. succeeds in, in building up an indigenous semiconductor right. industry. Well, we're coming to the end. I, I, I wish we had more time, but uh, as a former School of Engineering Dean, I can tell you that one reason the United States has so many international students in science and engineering, especially PhD programs, is that we don't have enough qualified domestic students who want to study in those areas of electrical engineering, computer science, and materials. For many years, we, and of course, other Western nations, have been filling the gap with international students. In fact, we compete to recruit them. Right now, the semiconductor industry and indeed the entire technology sector cannot find enough of the technically trained people. We need educational reform, but that's a topic for another panel. So I want to thank today's panelists, Ramko Zuetzlut, Lindsay Gorman and Chi Fu Chen. I promise them that we're going to have a reunion in Athens in a year from now and take them up on the Acropolis. I am Max Nikias, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Galov radis in Elada. Yasas.